My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Adriana Salazar and Migmahan. Salazar grew up in Colombia, where she initially developed her passion for social justice and where she was a human rights defender for more than two decades. In 2003, she moved to Canada. She currently lives in Toronto and works for a women-focused settlement agency. She works with immigrant communities around issues of political, economic, and social inclusion, and much of her work over the years, both in Colombia and in Canada, has involved using techniques of popular education, an activist pedagogical tradition particularly associated with struggles for justice and social transformation in Latin America. Mi'kma'han is a Mi'kmaq woman of the Fish Clan from Eskinobidich in Wabanaki Confederacy Territory, colonially known as Burnt Church, New Brunswick. She has been involved in struggles related to indigenous rights and women's rights for most of her life, and in doing cultural and language revitalization work. All along, much of this has involved working with community, particularly with women, particularly with young women, to empower through cultural teachings, traditional spiritual practices, and teaching on the land. Her work also includes facilitating links between university and First Nations communities. Both Salazar and Migmahan are members of the National Steering Committee of something called Writing Relations, which describes itself as, quote, a growing, women-led, pan-Canadian network of adult educators coming together to strengthen our capacity to work critically, creatively, and collectively with marginalized communities for radical social change, end quote. The network brings together a wide range of people doing grassroots educational work focused on, as the quote says, radical social change. Its members are all deeply embedded in their own communities and already doing important grassroots work. The network aims to create opportunities for such people active in different contexts to support each other and to strengthen both their specific projects and broader movements that are working for justice. Writing Relations currently consists of three hubs in different parts of the country, each of which also has smaller groupings associated with it called pods. The hub in eastern Canada is focused on indigenous women, the hub in central Canada is focused on immigrant communities, and the hub in western Canada is focused on low-income communities. The network is funded by the Catherine Donnelly Foundation, an organization originating from a progressive community of Catholic women religious that has in recent years been particularly focused on developing a decolonized approach to philanthropy. According to its website, the foundation works based on a, quote, radical commitment to social change and to empower the marginalized, end quote. I speak with Salazar and Migmahan about their respective grassroots work and about the role of the Writing Relations Network in supporting and enhancing that work. My name is Mi'kmaq Han, and I'm Jagat clan from Mi'kmaq Nation, which is the Wabanaki homelands in the eastern Atlantic. I'm from a community called the Skidawabadich in New Brunswick. I've been a longtime advocate working in adult education in Indigenous communities. And most of my life, I've been doing activism on Indigenous rights and women's rights. I've worked very closely with our culture and language since as a young person, I've been working in my community, working with young women, empowering young women, mothers, doing teachings. And now in my grandmother years, I'm doing grandmother teachings to empower women, drawing from our culture and practicing our spirituality ceremonies and doing on land teachings reconnecting youth and women and elders to our culture because, as you know, our language and our spiritual practices were outlawed in our homelands across the country. So that's been my life's work. And so Catherine Donnelly put a call out to continue their work in empowerment, social justice, to look at creating hubs across the country to look at radical social change in uh, adult education 
And so the three hubs that was created was one in the Atlantic, one in central Canada and out west. And the three focuses of those hubs for the Atlantic, it would be on the Aboriginal women because it is a women-led initiative. So it's Indigenous women. And it was the work that we've been doing in the East in peace and friendship work and looking at reaching out to women and creating support here in the East and in the Central, which Adriana will talk about. The hub is focused on refugee and immigrant communities and out West would be focused on low income communities. I was recommended by women here in my area to be part of it, to be part of the National Steering Committee. And so that's how I got involved with writing relations. And because I come from a matriarchal culture, uh, I agree because this is a women-led initiative. It doesn't mean it's all women, but it's women-led. My name is Adriana Salazar. I am a woman immigrant from Colombia. I arrived to Canada in 2003, given the armed conflict situation that we were living in in Colombia at that time. In Colombia, I was a human right defender for over 20 years. I'm from a country where we are still facing a variety of difficulties in terms of poverty, war, social tensions, and It's also a country where education is basically a privilege. So since I was young, I was very much interested in why education is just a thing that can be accessed by people with money in my country. So I still looking for alternatives, educational approach that allow us to reflect why society was built in the way that some of the people were very well and others were having nothing. That was the big question that I had when I was younger. In Colombia, there have been important advances and reflections about popular education, in particular in rural areas. So I started working with rural communities and poor communities with the principles of popular education. So when I came to Canada in 2003, for sure, I was looking for, you know, project space where people were reflecting on some of the principles of popular education. And then I found this group of people around the Catherine Donnelly Foundation, people from all over Canada who were thinking the same thing, how vulnerable communities can reflect in their own realities and understanding their own realities, they can propose actions to come together and overcome the critical situations. Talk a bit more about the different approaches to grassroots education that you've each taken up in your own respective work. When we talk about popular education, we talk about a model, an approach in which the role of education is not the traditional role of memorizing, of repeating of maintaining the power relation between teachers or facilitators and people who who are part of the processes is when you are looking for alternatives in which people can reflect about their own reality. I think that people should be the ones who decide their own futures. So it's basically a role of reflecting critically about their own realities and from that critical thinking to promote some kind of social transformation. So I think that is about coming together to promote a more equitable society. I've been really focused on Indigenous community, particularly my community and the region here, networking with women. We all have a strong network in the Mi'kmaq and Wulustugui communities in the province of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and Quebec, because that's our Wabanaki homeland. So there's a real strong underground movement among women who are the most invisible in our communities. And because of my life experience with Canada and the provinces and institutions outside of my community, I've become very protective or like my defenses are really strong and I didn't have much trust 
We've never built that kind of a strong, good relations outside of Indian country with most of these establishments. The colonial system has kept us apart. And so in the beginning, coming together as a group was a real new experience, really a breath of fresh air for me, because at first I didn't even trust the process because I was thinking people have a tendency to say that this is going to be something a little bit different, but it's always been still working out of the colonial structures, policies, and so on. And when we were told this is women-led, meaning that this is going to be focused on what our thoughts are working with uh, women's perspective and looking at community wellness and the needs of areas where we're from. It started to feel different and I started to feel comfortable and it was very important and it was very emotional and I bonded and became very connected. Bringing down those barriers and hearing each other, community voices sharing at that level instead of the colonial institutions speaking on our behalf and misrepresenting all the groups across the country and globally when now we get to hear each other's voice and that's made me grow and there's an exchange of the resilience and what's effective. You know I was feeling a little nervous and then I had to realize the scenario yes the scenario that we are having right now. We are three people here around a mic, a recording machine, a man from a radio interviewing and asking to two women. One of them is an indigenous woman and me, an immigrant. The both of us, English is not our first language. So that's exactly what I am doing. It's what popular education is about. It's about reflecting the real condition in which we interact. So right now here, for sure, among the three of us, there are some power relations and there are some structures that are there that are not built by us, but they are there. And I think that that is the popular education about the possibility to question why we live in the way we live and why that way of living left too many people behind. And that is the question that we all at the Russian relation has. Why that inequality? Why lack of access to some group of people? All the people that for society is just no worth it is what popular education brings together. And I think that that is what I call the magic of popular education. I think the writing relation has been that big umbrella where all these different little unknown experience of oppression or persecution in some cases have come together and tried to give the chance to dream with a totally different society, but not different itself, but with different structures, economic, social, etc. structures. Writing relation is a space for dreaming, but I just play with dreaming concretely because we are connected with our communities, we are connected with even in our own lives. One of the things that I felt so inspired to step out of my comfort zone and to join the National Steering Committee on Writing Relations and why I made that commitment was I was so inspired by the objective of writing relations. It was a woman-led initiative towards radical social change. And for me, what that meant was to be able to bring the voices at a national setting of our conversations that we've been having for so many years in indigenous kitchens of women and looking at who we are as a people, that we are a woman-centered culture. Our systems were matriarchal, matrifocal, and matrilineal, and all that was displaced. Bringing this into the larger form to start to educate larger supporting groups of the hubs across the country was so hopeful for me. And so my place in there is to be able to continue the work that we're doing here at the ground level. And then for the first time hearing different women from other nations and the Canadians who are the new settlers who are talking the same. And we've just been inspiring each other. And what we've been nurturing and creating with writing relations is maybe something that will can be contributed to the rest of the world, certainly to this country. 
What do the core activities of writing relations consist of? We are a pan-Canadian network, so it requires a lot of communication. We all are immersed in collective processes, community grassroots initiatives. We all are in like a struggle in our own communities, in our own practices, in our own professional areas. We are every day a struggle with tension, with frustrations, with more exclusion. We know what is the reality. Writing Relation is a project that brings us together, but every one of us is already connected with their own communities and their own networks. So what we try is to have a life network in which people are coming organically in small groups at the every hub are having their own reflections and they decided in their own agenda, they decided in their own priorities, they decided in their own practices, but come to the right of relation to reflect on what we are doing and what we are doing and why we are doing. And if what we are doing is really promoting and bring even slowly that social change that we deeply believe must happen. So weekly, people around the country may be coming together in that small group, that small group connect with other groups. They try to center their reflection about the more pressing issue that they may have in the moment and reflect on that. We reflect a lot in our practices. We have meetings, virtual meetings now. In the past, before the quarantine, we were having areas gathering. We have a regional gathering and we had national gatherings. So even if we, during most of the time, are working in their own communities, we come to this collective space to share with others who are around Canada, thinking in their own practices. We all come together and make the questions that we have and try to find responses. This project works in a very much different way than other projects. This is not about outcome. This is not about number of people who attend meetings. This is not that numerical thing. I think that the indicator is connection. I think that the indicator is like collective reflection. We have some resources assigned annually that are resources support the work of the network. So sometimes part of the conversation, for sure, is how we distribute those resources, depend on the need of the communities, depend on their even geographical realities. Here in the Eastern Hub, which is Indigenous women-led, a lot of the communities in this area, I think, were being misrepresented at the community level because everything has been so colonized at The Native communities that are recognized are really federal reserves and that they're hierarchical structures and the leadership, the representatives that have been in our communities replaced the Indian agents. So we have Indigenous members now, which was structured by the federal government, the chief and council governing systems in all the Indigenous reserves in Canada. And in that, it's still very hierarchical and the voice of woman is not the main priority, just like the country. Those are still working in the colonial structures and they're very monitored and they have to follow the federal policy. There's many people that fall through the cracks and that they don't receive the support that is needed. So that's where the networking in the grassroots movement among women, because the women were the most controlled and relegated groups, and they were the have-nots. And so in working with the writing relations, it's been hopeful because it was about beginning to receive some support, be it monetary or emotional And then we've been doing work without that kind of support for a very long time. The Eastern Hub has provided a space to be able to help women come together and then to support childcare. So we can come together and share ideas and empower each other, build those stronger networks of how we can be there for each other. And that means workshops, information sessions, spiritual gatherings, which is the foundation of all our gatherings, and workshops teaching women proposal writing, grant writing, and partnering with each other. More recently, food security has been a big project, and we have network of women sharing knowledge and exchange. 
How would you say that being part of the Writing Relations Network has strengthened or shifted your own practices as an educator rooted in your own communities? Writing Relations has provided me with the space to come together with other women who think that the way we are living now, the way that we are making our priorities, the way that we are not connected to our government, the way that we are not heard, the way that we are not able to voice our concerns, the way that we are not sometimes even able to shape policies that are going to affect us. So all that questions are the questions that we had in common. So being in writing relation for over six years has impacted personally hugely. Because first of all, I start critically thinking on what it means to be an immigrant to Canada, what it means to come from a country or to have to come because some of the political prosecution situations that are happening to many people around the world. As we came to this country, were supported by this country to come as an immigrant, we start having a conflicted relation with the country itself because we are very, very much grateful for giving us the opportunity to be here, to maybe protect our families or maybe protect our own life. So we are very grateful, but at the same time, we realize that inside the Canadian society, there are also a lot of injustice and a lot of discrimination. And all the process of colonization has really erased from Canadian collective memory critical teachings, critical nations, uh, even all the indigenous sisters and brothers that are all around. Immigrant women are one of the poorest people in Canada, and that is really unbelievable. And working with immigrants made me collect a lot of individual cases. But after some years, I was start thinking, okay, this is not an individual film. This is not an individual failure. This is something in the system that definitely keeps some people out. And immigrants and indigenous community has that in common. So I think that that has been one of my big learnings. I mean, to really bridge my struggle as an immigrant to indigenous people's struggles in terms of exclusion. I think that create that real solidarity, concrete solidarity of being there to reflect in your reality, to say, you know what, these are the things that we can do, or these are the steps that we should follow, etc. And at the personal level, I must say that as a Latin American woman coming from a country with, in general, although I'm not saying that everybody, but in general, a very strong machism culture, a culture where men are the ones who decided, where men are the ones who govern. This project and the reflection about being a woman led woman, wow, it has been personally an important opportunity to reflect in my own intersectionalities as a woman and as a mixed woman, uh, women with an uh, indigenous background, because yes, in Latin America, we are very much mixed. So yes, reflect about my role, my role in my family. What has been my role? What has been the role of women in rural communities? It's a learning and it's an awakening process of realizing that Wow, we as a women, and definitely at the personal level, that question of connecting my social justice ideas with the way of being a woman and exercise my femininity in their entire complexness is incredible. So not only at the professional level, but also the personal level it has been a huge impact. For me, it certainly has brought my perspective, my understanding through the stories of women across the country, and that these are women who are in many leadership roles. Because leadership in adult education language is not what the colonial system recognizes. And that in itself is so empowering to understand that because sometimes in a rural isolated setting, we don't think that we have things to contribute or what our thoughts are on the needs of our family members and in our communities it doesn't hold weight and has no value in that colonial system or it's not heard on that level. Because we are living in a hierarchical reality where people who are carrying certain titles carry more weight than the ones who are not, which is why our communities across the nation, not just in indigenous communities, but this is what we're dealing with. 
So that's confirmed a lot for me from hearing their voices across the country from women in low-income communities and refugee and immigrant communities, like the women, what they've been sharing about the history of their homelands and some of their own personal struggles and being witness to the voices and making those connections. We're weaving our lives together and we're part of that oneness so now it's like I'm not working kind of in an isolated setting with Indigenous sisters and brothers, but recognizing that this is a human condition that we're all committed to improving. So it's made me a better person and learning from each other. We began to strengthen our own voices even the way of communicating, you know, my vocabulary and I've become more effective in trying to share knowledge. There's growth when we are disciplined to listen and it's not just one voice because I've been like really just strong being the voice for Indigenous women and youth and elders. And now it's like when I talk about injustices, my vision has broadened the vision that I have and the basis that come to me is beyond my community. It's confirmed about my ancestral teaching and what my language is teaching me that we've never distinguished people and writing relations is all about reaching out to families, members, individuals that we're all community and we're all family and that we strengthen our network, our communications. So we all have a voice because there's no general assemblies happening anywhere in this country other than the leaderships, but the grassroots people, there's no voice for grassroots anymore other than a few media stations like what you're doing. So writing relations is about all that. And the heart of it is about how do we begin to write relations with each other, within ourselves, with each other, and how to live rightfully with land, our sacred mother. You have been listening to my interview with Adriana Salazar and Migmahan of the Writing Relations Network. To learn more about their work, go to writingrelations.org. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, SoundCloud, and other platforms. I'm Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, published by Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week.